Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our expert, non-expert and special guest James, Lord High Commander of the Science Cupboard, first of his name and knower of nothing. It's been a while since I've done one of these. It has. <laughs> stupid, that name is. It's a wonderful name. Uh, as always, we're wearing togas. We've had to move room because of some errant drilling. Uh, and today we're going to look at the third king of Rome, Tullus Hostilius. Stop chuckling at errant drilling, Taylor. Previously on Stupid Ancient History, we've been looking at the very early stages of the foundations of Rome, from Romulus founding the city on Palatine Hill. After being saved from the river by a she-wolf. Or a prostitute. Or a prostitute. <laughs> um, and established laws, policies, and a lasting peace with the surrounding tribes. After stealing the Sabine women. Yeah, all right, fair enough. And then after 37 years in power, he was replaced by Numa Pompilius, a Sabine who went around reorganising Rome, making them far more obedient to the gods and a lot more peaceful. Yeah, and during his 40-year rule, he also built a temple to Janus, put priests in charge of key parts of Rome, pretending to meet a goddess in the woods at night, whatever was going on there, <laughs> um, and never went to war the whole time he was in charge. It's not, that's not the sort of person I come here for. Oh. He was quite boring. I agree. So, the logical starting point for this episode, I'm assuming then, would be the peaceful death of Numa. Yep. Oh, his death was boring. <laughs> yes, it was quite, yes. So, we're told that following the death of Numa, there's another interregnum. Because that worked so well last time. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, Livy doesn't give us much detail about this one, other than the people in the Senate seem to have chosen Tullus Hostilius as the obvious candidate. What, what was good about him? Why? Well, Tullus is the grandson of Hostius Hostilius, that famous Roman warrior who fought with Romulus against the Sabines. Yeah, and it would seem that the Romans were worried that other settlements would think that they had grown weak during Numa's reign, because he was a bit boring and didn't go to war. So, so were, they, were they keen to have a Roman, not a Sabine? Yeah, I, did, I think they were just more keen to have a scrapper rather right, than okay. a guy who sits there praying. <laughs> they were bored of that. So this book's called Hostilius. Is this where you tell me, like, this is where we get the word hostile from or something like that? <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad show, actually. Um, so it would probably seem. Livy describes uh, Hostilius as being more warlike than Romulus. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's no mean Don't kill his brother for trying to do You want to see what this one did to his mum? No, no. No! So... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's no mean feat given how many battles Romulus got himself into, definitely. Yeah, and also it seems that Tullus himself thought the Romans were getting a bit soft, a bit flabby. So as soon as he becomes king, he began looking round, sniffing around, trying to find a reason to get into a scrap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and handily for him at that time, along the borders with Alba Longa, there should be a map yep. I'm assuming coming up, yes. Romans had been raiding Alban lands and the Albans had been raiding Roman lands. So we just decided to set them up then? Well, yes, sort of. It seems that warlike as he was, um, Tullus was quite keen to not be the one to be blamed for the conflict. He wanted an excuse. He wasn't a, a bloodthirsty warlord, but right, he still okay. wanted a scrap. Yeah, so he hatches a plan that would effectively trick the Albans into being the ones who actually started the war. Even right, though he okay. wanted it all along. Yeah. So he, he can just be there going, oh no, war! Yes! Yeah, the pretty ultimate, much. The ultimate... <laughs> Stirrer. Yeah. Yeah. So how does he do it? How does he trick the Albans to go into war with him? Well, it seems Tullus is already quite experienced in kind of how this sort of thing works. You can't just pile in with a bunch of fellas and start a scrap. So he uses this to his advantage, this whole kind of early diplomacy thing. And Livy tells us... Both parties sent ambassadors at the same time to ask for their belongings back. Tullus ordered his men to carry out their demands as quickly as possible because he was sure that the Albans would refuse and so they could easily start a war. Okay. So, Tullus's ambassadors go to Albalonga, they hurry home as quick as their legs can carry them uh, after demanding their stuff back with the ultimatum that if the goods aren't returned, war would begin within 30 days. Yeah, and the Alban leader refused this initial demand, thinking this would likely lead to further negotiations, but Tullus has got other ideas. Right, okay. How, how, what are the Albans like? Are they... Just, do, do we know? Are they're they just guys. They're just, they're just, they're just there, basically. Yeah, I mean, they, they are semi-related to the Romans, but 
you know, they're not particularly aggressive. They're not particularly peaceful. It's someone who he can, yeah, he can work around. So, as the Roman ambassadors come pegging it back to Rome, Tullus began meeting with the Alban ambassadors, knowing full well his guys are back. Mm. And Livy says he let the Alban ambassadors say what they had come to Rome for. He did not know what had happened and wasted time explaining that they were very sorry to say anything to upset Tullus, but they had been ordered to ask for the goods back and to declare war if they were refused. So they're taking the time and all this dithering um, into all this, the fact that Tullus already knows that the Alban king has already refused. Um, the Roman demands and it gives Tullus the perfect legal opportunity to go to war. Mm. So the Albans have already refused. He's letting the Alban negotiators do their bit. Then Livy pipes in then with... Tullus replied, Tell your king that the king of Rome calls the gods to witness that it was your people who first sent away the ambassadors, asking for goods back, and so you will have the destruction of war. It's quite succinct. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like he planned this yeah. in advance. So we're going to war. Kind of. Um, yeah. Livy describes the war like a civil war, so it's almost between kind of parents and children. <laughs> that just sounds quite funny. Just, okay. Again, anyone listening from the NSPCC, Helen does not regularly go to war with her husband or small child. No. Uh, so, h how, ha what happened? <laughs> you just lost it. <laughs> this is a really weird way to describe a war. Yeah, between yeah, parents and children. Um, yeah. The, the thing is, they have a shared ancestry. So the Romans claim they are descendants of Aeneas, mm -hmm. the Trojan warrior who fled Troy in 1200 BC. Yeah, with his dad on his back. Yep, that's yeah. the guy. And according to the myth or story of Aeneas, his son Lullus went on to found the city of Alba Longa, well before there was a Rome. So Romulus arguably could be regarded as an Alban. Right, okay. So that's why it's a civil war, because they're considered the same... Yeah, they're from... They're both descendants of Aeneas. They okay. have the same heritage. Um, but anyway, this starts to build up. Uh, the Albans start, obviously. They're a bit put out by Tullus, making them look like fools. Um, and they start attacking Roman lands with a huge army. And they're quite successful, and they're able to set up a military camp five miles away from the city of Rome. Yeah, but as soon as they'd set it up, their king dies in the camp. Just dies. Just dies. No, no, just yeah. like that. No shenanigans, just someone just, actually dies for once. You're right, King? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Gone. Um, Tullus claims that the gods are actually punishing the Albans for their illegal war. Yeah, and the Albans, I would say justifiably, were quite kind of spooked by this, and they saw this as a bad omen. I mean, I think that's fair. If your leader just drops dead, yeah. I would say that that is you're a right, King? bad omen. Oh, no, he's dead. Do we know if he was an old man or... He's, he's just a man. Just Livy a doesn't give those details apart from he dies. Right, okay. Sad times for him. So is that it then? King snuffed it. They, they all pack up and go out. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, they still have to resolve the conflict some way, um, even though one king's dead. So one night, Tullus sneaks off to meet the new Alban leader, a man with an epic name, not at all made up, a man called... Metius Fafetius. I love this name. That's it's so name. good. <laughs> Metius Fafetius. <laughs> absolutely not at all made up. What's wow. his name? Metius. Metius what? Fafetius? <laughs> yeah, that'll do. Uh, do we know why? Was he the son? Why, why was he? He's got the coolest name. That's why he's the king. Is that how he picked leaders? No, but he's just the guy in charge. <laughs> But anyway, brilliant name aside, um, both leaders are now in a bit of a pickle. So they're committed to a war that the people don't want to fight, and then more worryingly, they both worry about the Etruscans. Who are they? Um, well, they, like we said, they're both concerned that the Etruscan people, again, they're on the map, uh, they're a massive tribe, they're a huge group of people. Um, they're worried that they will simply wait until the Romans and Albans have just fought each other and then simply sweep in and pick up, what's left. pick up the rest and take everything. So, m making sure they don't end up in this bit of a pickle, this Etruscan melange, um, Tullus and Metius come up with a cunning plan. Can you use his full name, please? Metullus Hostilius <laughs> and Metius Fafetius <laughs> come up with a cunning <laughs> plan. Which is, according to Livy, <clears throat> 
by chance there were triplet brothers in each armor who were of similar ages and strength. I mean, that, of is, course they that were. is so convenient. So convenient. It's generally agreed that they were called the Harati and the Curati. 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 There we go. Um, it says, most say that the Harati were Romans, so I'll go with this. Their kings pushed <laughs> the triplets to fight for their countries and the winning side would control both countries. So... Okay, so Tri rather than... Triplet fight! Yeah, triplet rather fight! Rather than a big massive army, just go, you three, fight those three, yeah. Yeah. and then we will just call, call, it call, it, call it even after that. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Also, right, okay. handy that you've got three triplets of military got, age. Three also, sets of triplets, after going yeah. through childbirth, there is not a hope in hell that there would be many women cobbling around at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> three triplets, and either, you know, that none of them had died, I'm sorry, but no. That's I'm a, a twin. My mum got through that. Yeah, but you weren't born a thousand years ago. Imagine if you had another twin sister. Let's Surely you... they're just playing the averages. That one might be nice. <laughs> we'll just leave you with that thought. <laughs> so we're going to have an epic triplet fight. Yeah. Right? So both armies agree a time and a place to fight. Yeah, it's Tesco. Armies. <laughs> yeah. Six of them. It's Tesco car park after school, James. <laughs> Gotta be there, RB Square, as you would say. I swear no one said that since the 1950s. <laughs> I was say, who would say that? <laughs> Squares. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the armies agree because they want to watch. Yeah. <laughs> so the armies assemble to watch the fight, first agreeing to a treaty that the winning side would become the ruler of both peoples, all signed off by the priests and therefore the gods. Just like any after school fight. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Um, and then the fight starts. And Livy tells us The young men ran at their enemies with weapons drawn, as if their armies as if they were armies on their own. They did not seem worried about their own safety, only the future of their countries, as the power or slavery of their people depended on what they did. The great horror of it shook the spectators and the first clashing of the arms and the glittering of the swords and their voices and breath stopped as neither side was winning in the hand-to-hand -hand fight that followed. Then there were wounds and the sight of blood. Two Romans fell, one on another, but only after the three Albans were wounded. Right, so we've got two dead Romans, three yep. wounded Albans. Yeah, I mean, and the it, third Roman's fine, I'm guessing. Well, his brothers are dead. Well, not that great. A little bit sad. Yeah, but sure, yeah. But it's, it's like your classic Rocky script. You know? Yeah, he's on the ropes. He's shouting for Adrian. <laughs> um, it's all going to go horribly wrong. Here he is, this single Roman with the fate of his entire city weighing down upon him. Got to fight these three Albans, massively outnumbered. Yeah, but. Running around the wounded and weakened Albans, the surviving Roman was able to kill two of the Alban triplets very quickly. Okay, cool. So he's now one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, yeah, and he's, they're wounded. So when it came to the third, this guy's suffering from his wounds. He's been chasing this one guy around. <laughs> um, he can't really put up much of a fight. He, he's more worn out than anything. He's like, sack it. Let's just get on with it. And Livy says... The Roman was delighted and said, I have killed two of you in revenge for my brothers. I'll kill a third. So that Rome rules over Alba, the reason for this war. Standing over his enemy, he stabbed his sword through his neck. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You wanted an epic triplet battle. I did. And I got one. Yay. So, Rome wins. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. The treaty's verified. The Romans begin a triumphant procession back to Rome with Horatius, the surviving Roman hero, at the front. Yeah. Okay. But that's where it all starts to go wrong. <laughs> well, of course it is. Would you expect anything else, James? So just after a victory, it all goes wrong. Yep. Brilliant. So Livy says... So Horatius was at the front carrying the armour of the three brothers he had killed. His virgin sister, who had been engaged to one of the Curati, was in front of the Capena Gate. When she saw the military cloak of her fiancé over her brother's shoulders, the cloak which she had made, she tore her hair and screamed the name of her dead lover. So, right. he, so he killed his brother-in-law. as one of future brother-in-law, yeah. yeah one of these triplets was like, engaged, engaged to his sister. I don't think that would be important. Not at all, no. <laughs> but, you know, that's not where it ends. There's more. God. Livy? So it says... It made the fierce young man angry because she was crying at this moment of victory when there was great public joy. 
He drew his sword. He stabbed the girl, saying, Go from here to your dead lover with your unfortunate love. You who don't care for your dead brothers are for me and your country. This should happen to any Roman woman who cries for an enemy. The sight shot the, the senators and the people, but they also knew he had recently done great things. He was still arrested and taken to the king. God <laughs> what a nasty pasty. <laughs> Take this! <laughs> You're right, sister. Stab. Stab, stab, stab. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't... They didn't think about worrying about that at all. They didn't think it may, may you know, cause a kerfuffle. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly kind of next... Family Christmas is going to be a bit difficult, well, isn't it? Yeah. Well, not anymore. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, all family squabbles and murders aside, and um, this poses a real problem for Tullus as king. This new hero of Rome has just murdered his sister, <laughs> which is bad. Yeah. Um, what's worse is he's done it in full view of everyone. So he can't even deny it. He can't even deny it. They're not short of witnesses. It's more. Like, did anyone not see him stab his sister? He's definitely a dilemma, isn't he? He can't let him off, but he's the hero of the people. So what's he supposed to do? You punish the hero of the people or just... Let, let it slide. Either way, Tullus is going to look like a right mug yeah. at the end of this. Just paint the woman out to be a bit of a badden. And then maybe it'd seem all right. But he's still stabbed her in broad daylight. <laughs> I'm surprised you're coming around to that way of thinking. So. No! God! God. Every time they blame the women, you go, this is unfair. And now, and now he's like, jumping on ship. I'm just thinking of ways that you could get around it. I'm just trying to be practical. Right. Uh, uh, so uh, I assume we're going to find out how he does get Oh, yeah. There. So not taking Taylor's advice and just <laughs> painting this poor, <laughs> innocent virgin girl to be something horrific <laughs> even though people will probably know her or just what was your other suggestion just murder some more people and hope they don't notice then maybe you could go for the pets next yeah he didn't do that so Tullus has, an, has this problem um, and passing this judgement um, which should rightly so come with a death sentence on Rome's most recent hero would be a difficult choice for even the most experienced and wise ruler yeah but luckily Tullus has a plan, sorry. Is it to start another war? <laughs> that would be his last plan. No, he gets someone else to do it, James. Oh, really? Yeah, it's yeah. always the best way. Get someone else to do dirty work for So him. I can't make this decision. You do it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Right, okay. Not just one guy, though. He appoints two senators to pass judgment over Horatius. Because uh, they are the wisest and best, apparently. Okay. But even they can't do it. Um, I mean, I'm surprised there's not a set of triplet centers <laughs> that you can delegate to. No, they've just killed well, each what other. What is it when someone has six? He's not one of sex them knocking around. Sex no. There's no yeah. one of them knocking around. No. no. So he, he can't do it. He gives it to these two senators. They decide they can't do it because, again, they don't want to be the guy who's con who condemns this hero to death because, you know, people will just be throwing stuff at him in the streets. Mm. So then they go, right, what can we do? What's the next of you? Oh, we don't want the public throwing things at us. So let's make it a public trial. So, so they have a public God. trial held. So they're basically letting the mood of the people be the judge. Yeah. Surely this is a time. Couldn't they kind of knock up some dodgy omen or some kind of religious <laughs> thing that kind of decides for Look him. over there, it's a squirrel. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, like, I don't know. Just send him outside and <laughs> so he gets hit by lightning or washed away or... A wood nymph come out and yeah. say, oh, it's fine, yeah. How, how are you going to organise being struck by lightning? I don't know. Well, they could come up with something, couldn't they, and then just blame it on the gods. That's what I'd do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear God. Anyway, funnily enough, they don't do that. They have the public trial. Well, more field Because, yeah, lightning is unreliable in Italy. <laughs> but it seems that so they have this public trial it seems that the key part of this trial is the arrival of the father of Horatius and the murdered sister so their <laughs> dad gets in on it God. so the dad comes along and speaks to the trial and he says the people were most influenced by the father Publius Horatius who claimed that his daughter deserved to die I told you <laughs> I told you and if she hadn't deserved it he would have punished his son himself Wow. Told you. Make her out to be a bad in it all the way. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Good parent in that. Yeah, I'd have stabbed her and all. <laughs> so is this... Was that actually, like, the mood of the men at the time? Or do you reckon it's just like, just lost three kids. The one I've got left has to survive. <laughs> Please don't do this one. 
Um, he, yeah, who knows? So the people ultimately decide that executing Horatius would be maybe a little much, um, but he does still need to be punished. I really don't want to know what they decide. <laughs> well, this is what happens. So it says, a murder in broad daylight did need something to say sorry for it. There you go. Fair dues. Right, yeah. Yeah. So the father was ordered to make atonement for his son, but the state would pay. He made sacrifices traditional to his family, then put up a beam across the street and made the young men go under it. What? That's it. <laughs> That's the punishment. Limbo. Limbo! It even gets called the sister's beam. Oh my god. So his punishment, right, Horatius, you've murdered your sister in broad daylight, walk under that stick and we'll call it quits, son. And kill some animals that you said the state paid for. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It, it, it's some leftover geese we were, we were going to save it's them. It's a punishment that you don't have to pay for and you have to walk under a plank. I mean, that's a harsh punishment, walking under a stick. I mean, they don't even lower the stick. It's about six foot in the air. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally, walk under that stick. Wow. I mean, how did he survive? Uh, it was a, it was traumatised for life. Jesus. See, if you'd have made the stick fall on his head, then that could have been Still a only a stick. It's not like a tree trunk. Well, you know, I don't know. Just a tiny stick. So, so he got away with it. He got honest. away with it. And ultimately that now ends the war with Alba Longa. And they're now part of Rome. They're now part of Rome. Okay. And only, all its crazy laws if and punishments. only imperial conquest through history had been that easy. Well, ended <laughs> with someone walking under a stick. Yes, then a lot of lives could have been saved. True. So after all that, I mean, really, we should try and do some kind of semi-intelligent analysis of what you've just been through. I don't know what you mean. Perfectly legit. I mean, the the obvious thing is, that, again, we're back to this issue of myth or reality. There's a lot of kind of handy coincidences in this whole story. Mm. We're, we're sets of triplets not really yeah. common in ancient Rome. Are they really common in modern Manchester? No. no I'm, I'm about to look at the percentage of birth rate of triplets. Yeah, no, that is definitely... The, the triplets is very, very handy. Probably not triplets. It is this idea of... Um, getting heroes to fight rather yeah. than whole armies. That's not an unusual concept. Metius for Fetius as well. Do not that knock name. that name. That name. I mean, you can even look at the idea that Tullus Hostilius is the grandson of Hostius Hostilius. Mm. So you're almost establishing dynasties here. Um, that even though kings aren't meant to be hereditary, the kingship's not really moving out of a few key families. And, you know, all kings... Trace back to Romulus. Yeah. Did you ever find out the birth rate of triplets? One in every ten thousand. Yeah. So probably not accurate. No. So there's that whole issue of myth and reality. Um, also, the fact that it's so well written in terms of Livy somehow seems to know exactly what was said by who at yeah. what time, and it's all beautifully scripted. Even the most gullible historian would probably look at it and go, are you sure you're not filling these gaps in yourself, Livy? Well, I was just about to ask, like, any time there's been shenanigans in his writing, <laughs> it's tied back in some way to Octavian and the kind of Rome he's trying to put forward. Does this, or is this just pure artistic licence that he's just sexing it up? It's, it's mostly sexing it up, I think, but um, yeah. also the idea of the judgments and the judiciary and public courts and you know passing suit finding suitable punishments would probably have spoken to kind of augustan era rule where they are writing laws as they're going along because right. they've never really had to deal with these things as much aren't yeah they? no that's true and you've got like you've you put said about like the religious side and the moral side so is this whole idea about trying to create a morally I'm trying to say good, but I, I can't think of another a word. Moralist, yeah. Just that's a better word. Thank you, Jim. Morally good. So a morally, a morally just society where everyone does the right thing, and it's this idea of kind of collective responsibility, isn't it, for kind of the morals of Rome as a whole? So basically, Augustus is supposed to be the model, and everybody else is supposed to follow it. Mm. And if you don't walk under that stick, yeah. go on, James, oh. under that stick, go there now. But I'm a good boy. <laughs> Yeah, again, I mean, there are references in the text as well to this idea of the sisters' beam still being in Rome at Livy's time. So, okay. 
for whatever purpose. Just in case someone else knives their sister. Yeah, it's like, oh, get under that stick. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of hints to this idea of the Romans' idea of ancient Rome linking up with their, the Rome they lived in. Um, and again, these, the other thing we should really point out is that Tullus is the exact opposite of Numa. Mm. So we've seen the Roman kingship flip-flopping. Romulus, warlike. Yeah. Numa, boring. Tullus, war, war, war. There's a pattern that continues. I um, don't want to give you any spoilers, I'm afraid, James. <laughs> well, ultimately, what you can say is that if you're linking that again to Augustus, you've got all of this kind of change, and then Augustus is supposed to embody the, the best bits of... Yeah, he, he's a bit of everyone. He's a yeah. bit of Numa, a bit of Tullus, a bit of Romulus. Yeah, so it's a bit like, is Livy writing about all these people as a precursor to actually make Augustus look good yeah. when it comes to Augustus? Yeah. So there's that aspect as well that you've got to think about. Yeah, because they've, they've written there that he was warlike. He went yep. and started yeah. these fights. Should, would that be something that Augustus would, would not want himself portrayed as? He would like... No, you don't want to be seen as the, the warmonger, exactly. the guy who so, picks the so fights. Are they kind of put, put, paint him in that light to show Augustus how different he is? And yeah, and the, than there's than the that. diplomacy bit at the start, so yeah. even the Romans would be thinking, yeah, that's clever. <laughs> yeah, that's very clever. We wanted to fight you, but not get the blame. Winner. But ultimately, you don't want someone that just doesn't ever fight because they're no. seen as weak. So yeah. I would say that the other characters before Augustus are, are portrayed possibly on purpose as being very kind of one dimensional. Yeah. They've got one role right. and then Augustus is the embodiment of all of it. So he's, he's very much a multi dimensional mm. character who's kind of fully formed. So it's this kind of the gearing up, you've got all of these bits and then you put them all together and you get the perfect Roman He's leader. like the massive Power Ranger. Yeah. He's the Megazord. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that one. <laughs> that won't play to a GCSE audience, but never mind. No, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it, a nice quick overview of Tullus Hostilius, the third king of Rome. Thank you for listening. We hope this has been helpful. Leave us a comment below, and until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye. You waved at the microphone again, James. <laughs> it's just your force of habit. <laughs>